I'm going to walk you through SWS and setting up custom actions and saving project templates and effects chains for later use, custom actions to ripple delete, and some other really handy stuff that'll speed up your podcasting workflows and help you get the most out of this insanely powerful but steep learning curve Reaper program. Howdy, podcasters of YouTube. In this extremely long tutorial video, we're going to be talking about Reaper specifically for podcasters. So first of all, this is a pretty comprehensive tutorial on all things Reaper here. You can use the timestamps in the description if you want to kind of quickly jump to the editing phase or the setup phase. By the way, don't skip the, uh, the setup phase for Reaper. It is a powerful program, a little more complicated, requires setup. Don't skip that. So that said, without the further adoes, let's hop in and get started. So I do wanna kick us off here, just talking about what Reaper is and more specifically, what it's not. So Reaper is free to try, although it is technically a paid product. It's 60 bucks for an individual, uh, but their license, their free license lasts a really long time. In fact, I'm here to admit that I am technically still on the free license. I am going to pay them only because after doing the research for this video, I've actually decided I'm going to start using Reaper full-time as a DAW, so I am going to pay them. Before we dive in, I, I want to say why uh, Reaper isn't as, mu as used as much as I think other programs like Audacity. For beginners, it's more difficult to come in and just get things running as soon as humanly possible. Now, if you've been doing podcasting for a long time and you've worked with Logic Pro or Audition or Audacity or whatever, you'll you'll be able to get up and running much more quickly. But if you're a complete noob, this has a greater learning curve. Hence, you watching this YouTube video or Googling more, that is a bad thing for most beginners, which is why Reaper isn't promoted quite as much. But the good part of that is there's a reason it's more difficult and that's because it's more powerful. <laughs> There's much more customization options. I am going to show you this stuff later in the video, uh, but you can set up a custom action for daggum near anything, anything like custom. You almost think of it as like macros and automations and it's crazy stuff. It's crazy what you can customize. It's extremely powerful, uh, but it has a greater learning curve, right? So it's free. Uh, and it's 60 bucks. I recommend you pay if you're going to be using this. I'm going to show you some of my more simple <laughs> custom actions here in a few minutes, but just know there's a little bit more learning curve than some of the other dolls. So part number one of this video, again, is the setup. This is actually my template, which I'll go over in detail a little bit later. Uh, when you first open Reaper, it might look something like this, just a, a blank slate, blank canvas, baby. Uh, that is from reefer.fm. You can download it there, figure it out, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, whatever. I'm not going to go through that download and installation process. It's actually fairly simple. But what you also need to do, and almost everybody recommends this. Uh, if you go find another YouTuber, they probably recommend this as well. SWS. That actually stands for the, the company, I think, uh, that makes this. And this is an extension pack for Reaper. It's absolutely free. You can donate if you want to. I recommend you install this. I really do. You're going to see a lot more custom actions. And specifically, too, that I use almost all the time. When I edit a podcast in Reaper, it's like my bread and butter comes from SWS. Absolutely free. It's super easy to download and install. Um, it, it walks you through it step by step. I, I recommend every single Reaper user go grab that because it has too many custom actions to ignore. And one more similar thing is actually called Reapack, R E A P A C K dot com, is also completely free. Uh, you can also, you know, support them <laughs> a little bit here. I got to be honest with you, it's beyond the scope of this video. And in fact, I only use one or two of these like custom scripts and extensions. I don't, I don't write scripts myself, uh, but you can find them all over the internet. They have forums on here as well. I believe that you can go and search for different functions in Reaper. Again, this is more specific. It's on a like, case by case basis. And I think it's also more advanced for the scope of this video. So I'm not gonna talk about it, but it's also free and you can go ahead and download it now if you want to, even if you're not sure if you'll use it in the future, uh, I would just go ahead and get it over with. It's very lightweight. It's not gonna take up a, a ton of space on your computer. All right, so you have installed Reaper. You can now use it. Let's talk a little bit about menu bars and just a, a quick tour of the place, so to speak, right? So the first thing, 
for podcasters specifically, I'm going to talk about this timeline up here. Right now we're at like bars and measures, and you might be able to see these lines right here, like the grid. These are like bars and beats and stuff like that. Uh, if you have audio in here, which I'll actually just go ahead and drag just a little bitty snippet of audio on here. If you just drag it, by the way, it will create a track. You can also go to somewhere up here and insert tracks. I actually just use the shortcut, which for me is like command T. You can just insert a bunch of tracks that way. Uh, here is that audio file. And you should be able to see that I'm moving it around right now. And it's actually snapping to these grid lines. You don't want that. We don't want that as podcasters. So that is the button right there. I'm sure there's also something up here. I don't know where it is. But this little button right here will disable the grid. And now we can move our tracks like much more specifically. It's not like magnetized to a grid. There is a magnet button, which would help like me aligning these two audio files. Let's see how I can... Well, it's not working that great right now, but um, you can like have things stick to each other. I leave that on generally. And uh, while we're up here, there's a few more. So for one, there's an automatic crossfade. If you were to put two clips uh, together like this, you can see how it is automatically applying a crossfade right there. I like this. I always leave it enabled, but you can also disable it with this button right here. And then if I did that again, it, it wouldn't uh, have the automatic crossfade. And then this button, Ripple Editing. So this is in every DAW. This is every podcaster's bread and butter, in my opinion. Being able to make little edits and have all the audio files behind it stick together. Like if I delete this space in here, I want the entire project, the entire timeline to like move forward. This is Ripple Editing. So you can actually click this once and it's going to just do Ripple Editing per track. I know that's really small, but hopefully you can see that right there. And now whenever I move this, it's also gonna move everything else in the track. And there's one more amazing feature down here, which is if you have a bunch of tracks, obviously, you can click it again and you can see that it changed just a little bit. And if you hover over it now, it says ripple editing all tracks. So now I can do this. Isn't that like the coolest thing ever? I love this. I love it, I love it, I love it. And uh, I'm gonna show you more about how to like select and cut and just ripple delete like this. Uh, in just a few moments, we're gonna talk about custom actions. I actually built those. Um, I, I didn't create them actually, I stole them from somewhere on the internet. I don't even remember where. But I'll, uh, I'll show you how to set this up in just a second. It doesn't do that by default, but I'll show you how to ripple delete like that in just a moment. Okay, so speaking of the timeline and such, you, you can actually right click on the timeline up here and see minutes. Minutes, seconds, instead of minutes, beats. I love that, now I can see like, I'm 10 seconds in, I'm an hour and a half in. It's It shows time instead of the beats. That's a very helpful tip for podcasters, obviously. And a few more just housekeeping items right here. So the mixer, you can see a mixer of all my tracks right down here. And there's actually like tabs. This is the master track. You can actually enable this. I think if you just like right click up here, you can actually view the master track, show master track. Yeah, and then it shows the master track right up there. I, I usually don't do that. You can actually move these things. So right now I have this whole like docking bay empty right here, but you can also put things to the left and right. I usually have mine actually, I'll just click and drag, see if I can get this over here. Boom. Yeah, and that, oh, that's a little weird because it's uh, compressed somehow. But I usually have mine like this. So this is my master track over here. You can add effects to the master track as well as each individual track. This is generally how I use it. You can also uh, hide it. I'm hitting like Command M. I'm sure you can also like do it up here somewhere, but you can also pop it out. I think if you just right click on here, Dock Mixer. Yeah, okay. So you could actually pop this out if you wanted to as well and just move that around. I never do that. In fact, I'm hoping I can easily get it back. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, that's how you kind of move things around. This is generally how I, have, how I have it personally set up right here. Next up, I'm actually missing something right now. It's called the, it's called transport. I don't actually know why it's called that. Uh, it's this bar right here. It's probably enabled by default. In fact, if you're looking at Reaper, it probably, had, it probably was there. I don't really know why mine wasn't there, uh, but obviously you can play, stop, record, and you can toggle repeat, which is where you listen to like a section of time here uh, on repeat. You could also just press R. Uh, you can hide this. Another helpful thing is actually playback speed. So if you wanted to listen to your podcast at like 1.3x speed or something like that, you, I think you can also 
uh, type in here. I know that's really small, but you can also just drag the playback speed to increase. And if you right click it, you can preserve pitch in audio. So it doesn't like, if I listen to this right now, a universe that may or may not exist. Can I sound like an ant or a chipmunk or something like that, which I may not sound like that anyways, but you can preserve pitch and it should just play faster and sound the same. May not exist. Can this all been for not. So cool. Okay. It is time to talk about markers for just a second. So if you don't use markers, that's totally okay. I don't use markers either for most of what I do, but there's something really cool in Reaper. If you add a marker, if you don't know what a marker is, by the way, I suppose I should start with that. Let me just press M and you can see it inserted marker number one. If I come over here, marker number two, marker number three, marker number four. And there's a few things you can do with these. Obviously you can move them, you can rename them. You can also uh, just, I think it's like shift M or control M, command M or something like that to automatically insert a marker and prompt for a name. This is the intro or something like that. And you can move it around. Uh, but there's, there's something really cool you can do with Reaper. And that is insert a marker. You have to do equal signed and then start in all caps. It has to be equal sign start in all caps. And this is like officially the start of my uh, production now, I guess you could say. So if I went and exported, which we'll talk about rendering a little while, uh, in a little while, if I render this entire project, it would not render anything before this. And you might can imagine, you can do another one called equal sign end, it has to be in all caps. If I hit enter, this is now all of the project between start and end. And of course you can move these around uh, and delete them as needed, but I love this. And I'll show you my Do You Even Blog podcast template and why this is just incredible and a very time-saving feature. But just know you can mess around with your audio and it won't be exported. It's, act, it's not actually in the production. You can save files here. You can edit them and then put them into a production. There's no need to like create a separate project or whatnot. You can use markers as you start and end for like the entire production. Another really smart thing to do if you, if you do this, and I do, uh, put your cursor over start and I am going to have to figure out where this is. I think it's like project settings, which is this button right here. I'm sure you can also access it via the menu or whatnot. Um, yep, there it is, project start time. You can set zero to where the cursor is. So if you actually are using this start point right here, this is gonna be the start of your export, the start of your production. You just click that, you can hit okay. And now you can see everything back here has like negative time and this is zero. So if you are, doing a normal podcast and uh, you need to see times, you, you don't wanna start like back here when you're like working space, you wanna start at the, the, the beginning of the production. So there's only one other big part to the whole setup process. We even got to actually like, you know, editing audio in any way. Uh, and that is actions and custom actions. So basically you can think of this as key binds, just setting different, uh, keybinds and keystrokes and stuff to do different things automatically. Some of it's normal, like zoom in, zoom out. Other stuff is incredibly complicated in advance and the sky's honestly the limit. And you can like chain them or whatnot, as in you can have one keybind that does a bunch of different things, like really fast, right? Macros, if you will. And I have two, I stole these from somewhere on the internet. Apologies to whoever actually wrote these things because I can't even remember where I found you, but I have two that I use like as my bread and butter for editing. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you now how to set those up and more specifically what they do. So ripple editing, in my opinion, is like the be all end all of any uh, basic podcast edit, right? Being able to select a little bit of audio. Hopefully you can, uh, you can see what I'm doing right here. Uh, select a little bit of audio and either cut it completely or select a little bit of audio and ripple delete. And those are two custom actions that I built. Right now I'm actually selecting with my right mouse button. My left mouse button just moves this around and you can actually select time with the left mouse button. You can see if you're on the bottom half of the track, that's actually a different action than in the top half of the track. You can customize these if you want, but I'm using the right mouse button to select something and I'm hitting Z does a ripple delete and X does a quote unquote smart delete, which deletes the section and doesn't like 
mess with anything else. Oops, sorry about that. So uh, you are welcome to dive in to this action list and whew, do all sorts of things. There's like a million different possibilities here, like millions and millions of millions. But Z and X are my, my go-tos. Uh, so first of all, you can actually search for things. Like let's say I did need to do like a zoom in thing. You search like zoom in, zoom in horizontal, zoom in vertical. You can see the key commands, the shortcuts for those. Or what about just mute, right? Send, mute, track, receive. I mean, there's a million different things. Mute all tracks, mute track. You can set these up for a custom key bind if you want. You could add a, a shortcut that way. Uh, you can also search, find shortcut. Uh, what if I wanted to do Command Z? Well, that's undo. Command Shift Z, redo. You can search that way as well. Like what does A do? Shortcut not found. What does S do? S splits item at the playhead. That's how you split things. So that's a good way to like figure out what things, uh, what shortcuts do. And of course you can you can search this way. So I wanna go back up to my, my setups. I recommend everybody do these. This is why I'm including in this video in the setup portion is I think these are so bread and butter for podcasters. Everybody should do them. So I called this the mega ripple. This is my ripple delete. And I should, I press the wrong button there. Let me go back and find it. There you go. Uh, edit action. There we go. Edit action. Okay. So this selects all items in the current time selection. Remember I, you know, selected a time frame over here. It selects the items in that uh, selection, and then it removes contents of time selection, moving later items, a ripple delete. That's pretty much it. Um, you do those, you can search here, by the way, if you want to go ahead and create this search, select all items, select all items, select all items in groups, select all items, select all item in current time selection. You want to delete what you selected. And then you would add that you would, I think, double click and it'll go over here or you could probably drag and drop. And then you do remove contents. Uh, then you can like double click that one, which I'm going to delete because I already had it in there. Um, and then you click OK. You might want to make sure these are the same. I don't really know what those do, but there you go. And then I would recommend you do a different one. Edit, select it, cut some action. This is set ripple editing off. This is the smart delete uh, where I'm not doing a ripple edit. I am turning that off. And by the way, you'll notice that now when I used that a minute ago, it turned this ripple delete setting off because I had that as an action right there. If I wanted, I might be able to add it back in. If I had this toggled, I want it to stay toggled, right? Uh, I could probably do that. I might try that in a little while. Uh, but then I cut items, tracks, envelope points, depending on focus within the time selection, if any, a smart cut. It just deletes it, <laughs> basically. That's fancy, but there you go. Uh, that is the other two. What was the other one I had? Oh, uh, expand track height. This one is already set to a keybind. I do this all the time, so I put it to E. Basically, this one is super easy. It basically makes this wider. You can see it just makes all the tracks big and small. And indeed, you can, why is that? It's doing weird stuff here. It doesn't, it's not supposed to do all the tracks. I'm <laughs> not sure what's going on. Uh, you can also hold in the command or control button on your keyboard and do your mouse wheel. I think that's what it is by default. And that will zoom in and zoom out like this as well. You can also just use your mouse wheel. If you use your mouse wheel over here, I'm not sure if it's like this on default, but mine is zoom in, zoom out. Um, I actually have another custom action to zoom in, zoom out, not where my playhead is, but rather where my mouse is. And this is a custom action where to find it. I have no idea where that is, but I set it up to zoom, not where my playhead is, but where my mouse is located. Cause I like that a little bit better. And I saw that from some YouTube video uh, just a while ago, actually. So I, again, I can't remember who it is. Wish I could give credit. And you know what? I actually lied. There's one more important thing. I wanna talk about groups, tracks over here and then groups. They might be called folders actually. I think they're called folders. Uh, but you can actually do like parent and child relationships when it comes to tracks. So I am going to drag this track. You can drag just to like move them around as well, of course. Uh, but if you drag and you kind of move to the right, you can't hardly see it. There's a gray line right here where my mouse is uh, that just changes a little bit. You can't hardly see that, I know. But if you do that and you make it over to the right, this is now a child of this. And you can do multiple childs, of course. So this is a group, well, I, a folder. I call it a group, but it's a folder. And the point of this is all of the, the, the children tracks over here 
push their audio to the parent. Meaning if you added effects, which we'll talk about in just a little while, to this like parent track right there, it will apply to all the audio that is coming in here. So if I had a, let's say I had multiple tracks for voiceovers. I'm doing a podcast, I'm doing uh, voiceovers over here, I got like three of them. Uh, well, instead of adding the same compressor to like this one track and then doing it again and then doing it again, I could actually just do it to, well, it's gonna like add it right here, that makes no sense. I could do it to the parent and it would affect all of these sub tracks. So I come in here and do the compressor, there we go. And now it's affecting like all of these sub things. And actually it shows this visually as well. So you can see my different uh, little uh, files down here, I guess. And it's actually representing up here as well. And when I move those around, you can see it's representing uh, up top on this like parent track. So folders, groups, whatever you wanna call them, it's actually really powerful just for organizi organizing things as well. When I show you my template that I use, uh, the Doom blog template, you can see, I'm actually not gonna save that. You can see uh, three different groups, if you will. One is just like my normal voiceover track. And then I have an interview track where I do me and my guest and any effects, like I might do a little bit of leveling or compression just for the interview part. I would put it on this parent track, not the individual things. You can do individuals as well to like mix those tracks. But then I have like an extras down here as well. Uh, and then I have sound effects and music. So it's just a way to like kind of group and organize things, but also apply effects to uh, multiple tracks at the same time. I hope that makes sense. All right, so at this point, I actually wanna kind of talk about the editing phase. And I'm actually kind of, I'm just, I'm not gonna actually edit a full podcast, but I am gonna throw in a files using my own template. I'll show you how to save your own templates in just a little while. And then we'll walk through like some of the basic editing functions, if you will, so you could kind of get up and running, figuring out your own path uh, relatively quickly. So this is my Do Even Blog template. Again, I'll show you how to save these later on. But the first thing you'll see is a start right here. And you'll notice I also have the time set to start right there. I already told you about the tracks and then you see these things. So I have these over here. Every single time I create a podcast episode, I will go to new and then project templates and then I'll just choose this and it'll open this one that I got right here. These are my segues. I use these in uh, solo episodes a lot. Here's my intro thing. So each time when I come in here, Again, nothing here will be actually exported or rendered. So this is kind of like just working space. I will almost just like, uh, oops, I don't know. Usually don't do that. I usually just drag this over here. Oh, well, no, I don't. What do I do? Copy paste? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. That's not it. Yeah, I usually copy and paste. You can see I already messed up my like start right thing because I have uh, the ripple edit selected. I didn't have that. It, it, wouldn't do that. Uh, but I had Ripple edit all tracks. That's why I did that. I was wondering, I was like, wait a minute, I usually just drag and drop. <laughs> yeah, it's because I have Ripple edit turned off and I just drag this over to be the first thing in my podcast right here at the start. And then when I need these, I will usually option or whatever that's called, not control or command, but the one next to that, I think it's option to make copies of these segues. And uh, I'll just drag and drop them when needed on my sound effects track. It's pretty cool, right? And if I'm like way over here, I usually zoom out, I'll hit the home button to go back to the very beginning here and then figure out which one I need. And sometimes I'll just copy them and I'll come back to wherever I'm at. I usually add like a temporary marker. If I'm over here, I'll just hit like M just so I can figure out like where I am. I'll come back to easily. Like I go back to the beginning, I'll grab this one, like zoom out, and I think there's actually commands to go to markers, but I actually need to remember what they are. Oh, it's command two, there you go. So if I'm like zooming in and I wanna go back to where I was, I usually just hit um, copy, command two. Oh crap, that assigns it. <laughs> that assigned my uh, my marker for that. It's not command two. I can't remember what it is. Um, I don't know, my, I'm having a brain fart at the moment. But the point is you can easily go back to where you were editing at a keystroke. I just can't remember. You have to look that up, like jump to markers. I know it's a thing, I just can't remember what it is. But anyways, I would come back to wherever I'm at and hit paste down here. Oh, obviously adding files, I didn't really even cover that. So I got an interview right here. I am going to, I'm just gonna like drag these in just for the heck of it. Here's like a Pete interview. I'll just drag that on there. Here is my uh, guest, or actually that was my guest, here's me. It doesn't matter for this 
uh, video or whatnot. And then I had like a voiceover thing. I'll just like drag it up here somewhere. And I'm actually just gonna like delete that marker right there. Um, how do I do that? I don't even remember. Remove marker, there you go. I got some files in here. Let's say that I need to record voiceovers. Uh, first of all, you choose your track and you have to arm the track for recording. That's that button right there. I'm sure there's a shortcut, I'm not sure what it is. And once I do that, now you'll see my levels popping up here that I can monitor and uh, I can adjust like inputs and stuff as needed. This is obviously the volume of the track, by the way. I never ever touch this, but you could raise or minus the volume uh, that way. This is how you access your effects. You can also do that on the mixer down here. I can't, there, yeah, there it is. It's like right down there. Um, you can, we'll talk about effects here in a little while, but that's where you access that sort of stuff. You can also mute the track, of course. You can also solo the track, of course. And you should be able to go up in preferences and select your inputs and outputs. Audio, it's either audio or device. Yeah, it's audio device right there. Right now I am using the UMC 204 HD. That is my Behringer audio interface, but you could select whatever mic you got. Like right here, always make sure it's at 44100. Uh, sample rate, I'm trying to think if I do anything else over here. You can uh, select your output for headphones or speakers or, you know, whatever. Um, let's see what I'm missing for recording. Oh yeah, I, I think you can You can obviously hit this, the record button. I usually just do command R, that's what I have it set to. And I, I just hit it right there so you can see it's actually recording. And the thing I like about Reaper is it's fast. You can see me like zooming in and zooming out. I'm actually gonna stop recording. But while you're listening, you can also do like Hello edits, there, everybody. and it actually works pretty easily. So like delete, delete stuff. You can see I did that uh, that ripple delete that moved everything forward, and you can also come and select that, obviously to literally move everything, which also moves your start. By the way, if you do that to the very first thing, it doesn't do that when you you know select any of the rest of the stuff. But obviously, that first one. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Now you know how to move. Uh, pieces of audio, you know how to ripple delete on one track if you need. I'm sure there's also commands for that. I never can remember what they are, by the way. You can ripple delete on, or excuse me, ripple move on all tracks. We have our custom little um, X key just to like actually delete stuff. You can also put your playhead and hit, I think it's S to like split things. No? Oh. Oh, I had time selected, that's why. Oh, sorry, I'm pressing wrong buttons. Sorry about that. I'm pressing X. <laughs> I was like, why isn't it working? Yeah, you can press S to split at the playheads, in case you're wondering. Move around tracks, uh, ripple deletes, smart cut. What else do we need right here? Oh, envelopes. So I have a custom action set up, but if you just press V while you are on any of these tracks right here, I'm actually gonna just like make these a little bit bigger. If you press V, it will show the uh, envelopes right here. Now, you can actually click in this thing and do, obviously, volume, pan. I think it's volume by default. So if you wanted to change the volume of these things, you could like click in here to do like little points, create a new point. Um, you can also like control click, command click, shift click to do something, insert envelope points. I think it's shift. Yeah, shift. And of course, you can like drag the volumes this way, make it you know, louder, softer, or whatnot. You can also just command or control, hold that down and then click in here to draw. This is actually how I like, like if you're gonna, if this were a music track and I wanted to duck it, um, well, let's actually like hide this. Um, the reason I'm, I'm freaking out here is because I actually had a, a not volume. I set up my custom action. I set up V to not show the volume, but actually show volume pre FX. And the reason I do this is if I change the volume now, you'll see, um, it's actually reflected on the track above. Like I can do this and you can see it's making, it's reflecting the waveforms. You can actually see your changes right here. I actually think that's, that's really cool and powerful just to like see that in action. So I did volume pre FX. I think I actually just did this in custom actions, by the way. Just go up here, do volume pre, yeah, pre FX, and you could just like set that to V. You could do add and then just do V. That's what I did, yep. Um, and you can hide that. Now I'm like not figuring out how to hide it. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
Oh, the drawing thing. Uh, yeah, if this were a music track, just pretend for a second. I could come down here to this track, make sure it's selected, hit V, and now I'm just going to draw like a rough thing down here. I don't actually suggest doing it this way most of the time, only because if you want to change things later, you have to like... Now you got like a lot of different like points to work with or whatnot. But if you want to draw, well, there you go. You can do that. And let's move on and talk about effects. So obviously different plugins. Uh, there's a lot built in, of course, in Reaper. And oh, man, it's pretty straightforward, I feel like. Uh, you can obviously access it right here on a per track basis. You can also click down here. You might even see... Uh, you see these slots over on the right hand side of my screen? This is for the master track. I usually see these, I can't remember what I pressed a few minutes ago that made them disappear. I usually see these for the individual tracks, like these little slots right here. But really you can just click on these things and it'll show you all the effects that you have, the plugins and stuff that you have. And it opens up this. So I'm just gonna like show you a few of the built-in ones. Honestly, if you're a beginner going Reaper, you're gonna wanna watch this. If you already know what, if you already have third-party plugins or whatever, you can skip this part, obviously. Go ahead a few minutes. But I would probably do, I don't know, maybe just start with some EQ. There might even be some noise reduction. I usually use uh, an RX-7 noise reduction, but they have a little bit of, you can do noise gates at this point or whatever, but I'm gonna skip these for now. Uh, EQ, EQ, the one, uh, Rhea EQ, and, you can see I have like a bunch of them in here. Rhea EQ, I think is the official one for Reaper. It's probably the default one. Um, what track did I even add this on? I'm on, oh, I added it to my interview track. So it's affecting all these error <laughs> about. Things. So you can see the uh, the waveform feedback in agency. Here. In your, in your... Uh, I would usually start off with a high pass filter in here and I can't actually remember how to, yeah, there you go. Um, God, this is like so small. Can we make this bigger? We can make it bigger. Look at us go. Yeah, uh, you don't need anything below uh, like 90 to 100. I usually have mine like right around here. No no human voice stuff <laughs> like does anything down here. So I got a, a high pass filter uh, first and foremost. And bandwidth uh, like changes the, the shape, the pointiness, if you will, of these markers. And this isn't a video on EQing I'm agency in your, in your first class, but yeah. what I usually end up doing, uh, just to show you, I usually add a little bit on the high ends, not that much, but I'm just uh, get my thing to like level off. There you go. I usually have it like something like this and just like two or three decibels, two or three in here, somewhere around 2K, 3K is generally like where I start. This just makes things uh, a little bit more crisp. Uh, uh, makes the high end like a little bit more crisp, a little bit more listenable. And again, you I usually don't add anything at this point. Subtractive EQ is what I think most people recommend doing uh, first in the effects chain. I'm not gonna go through that in this video. I think it's beyond the scope, but yeah, well, well, there you go. You can put it right there. So let's go back and maybe do like add some compression next. Where's my, uh, my thing here? Oh, you can also bypass these just with this button. That's kind of handy, like the little power button signal thing looking right there. So I'm gonna go to add, that's uh, where my, my box went. Maybe add the compressor, the, the, the Rhea, Rhea comp, I think is what it's called. Rhea comp, you probably just search comp. Do that, put that on there. You can move things around. You see I can like move the orders around here. Let's do like a, I use elements by the way, from Isotope, not, or not elements, sorry, Nectar. Ne not Nectar Elements, I actually paid good money for Nectar 3, which I'm really happy with, it's phenomenal. Um, but once you start adding effects and plugins over here, you can turn them on and off over here, you can reorder them over here, close this if need be. You also saw the by bypass button on a, uh, where is it? Well, I guess that was that plugin up there, but you, you can bypass them just by like, unchecking them really. Oh, that is, there's the check. There's another check over there that you could bypass. All right, that's effects. The only other thing I really wanna talk about here is this effects chain you can save for future use. Uh, you can do a bunch of things from that menu. I just right clicked. First of all, uh, you can select multiple and move multiple if you want to. You can delete multiple if you want to. Um, but going back to chains, effects change, you could save this 
You could load the default, you could load a pre-saved one, you can save the selected FX as chain. So I'm actually gonna like select all these and go to FX chains, save selected. I already have a few, this is my uh, DYEB podcast chain in there. And you could save this and next time you want to just quickly add that to a track, like here are my interview tracks, I have like a voiceover, let's say. I would go up here and then go to load FX chain, and then DYEB, it's gonna open up a noise reducer and my elements plugin, I believe, and maybe even a limiter. I can't remember what it is exactly. Oh, it's four of them. Yeah. So I got D breath. Oh, this is the old one. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, I don't use D breath anymore. Uh, but that's a cool way to quickly save your effects and load them like with ease. Super quick. I love that. Effects change. Okay, just a few more helpful tips and tricks. So Version control. If you don't know what version control is, it's essentially duplicating your project when you make like big changes or like right after a big save or you're doing stuff, just to kind of keep the old versions as a backup. Like if you start screwing around too much and you're saving the project all the time, uh, it might be really hard to go back and find the way things were like 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. So Reaper actually has this up in the save menu, you can do save new version of project. And so mine's not actually saved at all. Um, but if you if you had your project saved, command S, control S, of course, you would quickly duplicate it. And you can actually, I'll show you, I did this earlier. Uh, where's my project? I had a test project going. Here is the, the folder for it. And when I did that, it just automatically create created separate projects in that same folder. So I could quickly go back and like double click these to open it up and access those old versions of the project. So it's not version history, version control, so forth, but it is a really quickly and easily way to make sure you don't lose too much. So I will usually do this just a couple of times while I'm editing, just, to, just for peace of mind. It doesn't take up that much space like on your computer or anything. And it's just a way to make sure you don't lose stuff. So uh, by the way, whenever you open multiple projects or whatever, it's like tabs up here. You can actually just close them out or whatnot. I think that's pretty cool. Let's talk about exporting and rendering, so to speak. So file render. This is how you export your stuff. So there's a few things you can do. Um, I use an Alphonic multi-track. Uh, if you don't know what Alphonic is, go watch my YouTube video on it. So I will often end up exporting my tracks into separate files and then running them through Alphonic. So what you could do in that case is selected tracks. I, I guess I would actually have to like come in here and select all the tracks, just Command A, Control A, we'll select everything. Or if you only wanted to like export these three tracks, obviously select those. Um, and you could, you could do that. Master Mix is obviously going to do the entire project mix down or whatnot. And you can also specify like the time. So if I, if I like wanted to select this, just this time area right here, you can come in and do custom time range or time selection, actually time selection. And the uh, entire project, as much as it sounds like it should do literally all of this, it doesn't. Remember the in and out markers that we set, the start and end. When I do entire project, it's actually gonna start right there. It's not going to include all of this stuff, the working space before that. I actually think that's like just the coolest feature in the world, to be honest. I just have these like segues and intros and outros that I use all the time, the background music or whatever you use for your podcast, just have them like sitting over there and you can drag and drop whenever you need it. And when you export the entire project, it won't export. It's gonna start at that start marker. And by the way, I think, I never actually put in an end marker. I never put the end and it just ends whenever your last audio file ends. If you wanted to specify, I'm sure you could, but I, I rarely ever do that. And if I guess you could have more working space over here on the right side, if you really wanted to, I don't know why you would, but I guess you could. So this is where you select, select, select where you would like to export. Um, and they got some quick things, but you can also just browse and choose like wherever you wanna export your file. This is where you change the file name, obviously. And when you update this directory, the output, it's actually gonna change where it renders to. If I just did downloads, for example, just do that. Uh, that changes it up. So uh, file, 
type down here, MP3, obviously you can mix down to that. WAV file, if you're gonna continue, I don't know, put it somewhere else. You can actually do secondaries if you want. You could do a secondary, like you could do WAV and MP3 at the same time, it'd be pretty cool. Obviously you'll choose some of your settings in here. Uh, auto wave. Oh, I was looking for my uh, <laughs> my bit rate. I was like, why don't I say my bit rate? That's because of wave file. Um, 96 is what I would usually do right here. And then you would do render. You can also add things to a render queue if you know what you're doing and want to get into that. I personally don't. You could also do mono, mono and stereo, like right up here, and render one file. I usually leave it to full speed offline uh, just because it's faster. It renders to like 10 times the speed of the, the audio right here. I'm actually gonna render because that would take still a little while because it's like uh, 40 or 50 minutes worth of stuff. But you could also just set it to 1x offline. I've never done that. Some people swear by it, I guess. I saw that in some, <laughs> some YouTube videos. But uh, that's how you export a file here in Reaper. And possibly last but not least, templates. The bread and butter of saving time no matter what you do in your podcast. By the way, I think you can also do the, the button above tab, the little squiggly lines, and then shift squiggly lines. I don't remember what that thing is called. To zoom in a lot, like if I'm up in here and I wanted to really zoom in, I could like, oh, that's not the right button at all, is it? There we go, you could zoom in like super close. I should have said that earlier, but I didn't. Anyways, uh, templates. So once you have, um, your track set up the way you want, your groups to set up the way you want. You can go ahead and add on effects, effects chains if you have certain ones that you use like all the time. You can set that stuff up and save it as a template. Project templates, save project as template. It's gonna prompt you um, for a name. You name it right there, obviously. Save it in this project and templates folder, which is here by default. And hit save, it'll save it. So if I did that and I closed out of this particular project that I'm working on right now. I don't have to save that. It's automatically there. I just closed down Reaper, so I gotta reopen it really quick. Reaper. So if I did that and wanted to start a new project with that template that I just saved, I'll do that in a second after this uh, purchase box goes away. I am gonna purchase this because I decided I, I use it enough now. But you can get away for free for quite some time actually. You would go to new uh, oh, no, you wouldn't actually. You go to Project Templates, there you go, and then you just choose the template that you saved. It'll appear right here, you just click that, and then boom, we're off to the races. I got my start point, the time's already set up, my tracks are already set up, my effects chains are already set up, I got my segues and background music and intros and outros and whatever you reuse from podcast to podcast that you can do stuff with. Pretty cool, right? I think it's really cool. I usually just drag this in here, and then boom, I'm off to the races. Hit the arm, the track for recording, start recording, and then good to go. One more thing that I'm technically not qualified to talk about. The project bay. Once you start adding a bunch of files and you have like lots of cuts in here, and hit S, 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 S. You can see like all my, all my tracks, all my stuff in here. You can actually go to file or view, oh gosh, it's view. Project Bay or Project Media FX Bay. This is actually kind of cool. I rarely ever use this, and I got to be honest with you, it's probably a little bit more advanced for most people, including myself, actually. Like I said, I'm not actually qualified to use this because I don't actually use it that much. But I did discover this the other day. Uh, you can quickly go through media items and uh, some source media. You can double click to play directly from here and there's some other cool stuff that you can do. You can rename files, you can move files, you can copy and paste. Uh, is, uh, you can add comments if you want to. If you have like a big podcast with lots of stuff going on, it actually could be helpful to just quickly scroll through. You can also search, by the way, like if you're renaming tracks in here, you could go into search and filter and like, I just wanna see uh, tests. I just saw that I had some that were named test. If you name certain things like intros and outros and voiceovers and interviews and guest names or whatever, you can come in here and search and kind of like figure out where those things are. You can listen to them. It shows you the link that says five instances of this down here. And without further ado, that's actually it. I hope you enjoyed this podcasters of YouTube. Please go watch some of my other YouTube videos that you might find interesting on podcast hosting or, Auda or not Audacity, but Auphonic and 
I got a lot of stuff here on the YouTube channel. Like, comment, subscribe. If you're in a blogging and podcasting and online business, hit me up with a friendly comment. Give me a like button or whatever. I'll see you guys next time. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Happy Reaper-ing. Adios.